Well, in case you didn't see the thumbnail or happen to watch the Canucks this season, the team has been an absolute train wreck. With tons of drama and uncertainty to go around, the team is bidding head coach Bruce Boudreau farewell. There's been so much to process involving this team, meaning that many factors have come in and ultimately played into making Vancouver one of the worst teams in the league. In this video, we're going to go back quite a bit in order to try and dissect how this fall into mediocrity has transpired. And with that, here is how the Vancouver Canucks turned into such a dumpster fire. So to really encapsulate everything, we're going back to the NHL draft of 2019. The Vancouver Canucks acquired JT Miller from the Tampa Bay Lightning. Since the departure of the Sedin twins, the team was in search of a veteran to mentor the younger players. And obviously on paper anyways, it looked like a great value for the amount of production Miller was able to give. He's on a good contract. We got him for four more years at a good number former GM Jim Benning says. Benning, who had drafted Elias Pettersson in 2017 and Quinn Hughes in the following year, felt that he needed a top six player that was in the prime of his career. And really on the surface, it appeared like a logical move when you look at what the GM gave up initially. It didn't seem bad at all. Fast forward to the draft of 2020. This was an important tidbit to include, because in my opinion, this is one of Benning's biggest blunders of his tenure. That has hindered the team's success. It's July of 2021, and the NHL entry draft is about to commence. But one of the biggest headlines that didn't involve Owen Power or Matty Beniers was a trade that Benning decided to execute. As a GM decided to send the Louis Erickson contract in a first round pick down to Arizona to sweeten the deal. Obviously, there were other players involved such as Jay Beagle and Antoine Roussel, but in return, the Nucks took Connor Garland and Oliver Ekman Larson off the Yotes' hands. Now, it is important to note that Arizona did retain a little salary on the Ekman Larson contract, meaning that 990,000 of his $8.25 million cap hit will remain on the Coyotes' books. Up until this point, the Canucks were in what you'd call a transitional phase. After bidding the Sedin twins goodbye in 2018, Benning had been able to put a competitive young group together. Names such as Elias Patterson, Quinn Hughes, and Brock Besser were some of the young core pieces that were giving fans some hope for the future. And even though they had made strides in the right direction in 2020 by winning a postseason round, the team hadn't made the playoffs in the season after. Therefore, instead of waiting for the Erickson and Roussel contracts to fall off of the books, the GM's solution was to add Ekman, Larson, and Garland to the roster. And while Garland hasn't been the worst player for the Nucks, Ekman Larson, on the other hand, has been a disaster in BC. So this move severely constricted the Canucks from then on out. As the cap hits combined are over 12 million a season, Ekman Larson also has a full new move clause. Therefore, if he doesn't want to be traded technically unless he's bought out, he'll be getting paid over 7 million a season until 2027. Coming out of the gate to start the 2021-2022 campaign, the Vancouver Canucks had the same Stanley Cup offer odds as the LA Kings, which may not sound like a big deal, but the Kings went on to almost take down the Western Conference winners. Therefore, considering that the Canucks finished fifth in the Pacific just speaks to how far the expectations were apart from reality, as the Canucks struggled immensely in the first half of the season, so much so that by early December fans were throwing their jerseys onto the ice and booing the home team. From November 11th to November 28th, the Nucks were only able to win one out of nine games they played. In response to the struggles fans were having to endure, the organization responded by firing head coach Travis Green and Jim Benning both December the 6th. Green's replacement was Bruce Boudreau. Boudreau, who had the most success in DC, coaching Alex Ovechkin, seemed to really thrive behind the bench to start. Fans adopted the heartwarming Bruce There It Is cheers that the coach humorously found annoying. And in the latter part of the season, things really began to brighten up in Vancouver. JT Miller had a career year and was able to record 99 points in only 80 games played, with 32 of those impressively being goals. Even though there was speculation that the forward would be dealt before the deadline, newly appointed GM Patrick Alvin held on to his star. And it was before this season commenced that we learned of Miller's freshly drawn up deal. The seven-year contract that is set to kick in next season has with it an $8 million AAV 
and a full no-move clause as well. However, despite getting some certainty on Miller remaining with the team, fans were treated to yet another slow start by their team, as Vancouver was unable to win their first seven regular season games. And it was during this time that Miller's true colors began to seep out into the public eye. Teammate Luke Shen was so frustrated with his teammate following their loss against the Sabres that Connor Garland instantly tried to break up the altercation. Even though we don't exactly know for sure what brought on the conflict, what we do know is that the loss against Buffalo wasn't just any old L. This was a game that fans decided to show the team how frustrated they really were by throwing jerseys onto the ice. This was game six of the losing streak noted before. And by this time, the mood was anything but cheery in BC. Also, when the Nucks were trying to even things up by pulling their tendy, well, let's just say Miller didn't seem enthusiastic on the back track. So again, even though this is pure assumption, it's possible that Shan's frustration with Miller's carefree attitude had reached its boiling point. Fast forward to December 30th of 2022. The Jets, after managing to score three goals in the second period, were attempting to protect their two-goal lead, going into the third. However, the goal margin was cut in half following a goal from Connor Garland. In an effort to tie the game, the idea was that naturally Bruce Boudreaux would be motioning for netminder Colin Delia to come to the bench. However, Delia didn't vacate the crease when JT Miller wanted him to. Therefore, because the goaltender didn't skate away as Miller was being pressured with the puck, Miller exploded in plain sight. Miller could be shown screaming at Delia and slamming his stick on the goalpost in frustration. After the fact, Miller, who was interviewed about the incident that blew up on social media, made some interesting comments. Well, unless it's inside our locker room, I don't think anyone's opinion really matters, to be honest with you. It's not the coach's fault. I don't even know why this is even being talked about. Maybe I shouldn't have done what I did. It's not out of anger. It was letting him know to go to the bench. I had full control of the puck. That's all it was, he commented. So, not only did rumors of some deep dysfunction begin to swirl around the Canucks in general, but also more recently around the team's medical staff. This part of the story takes us back to November of last year. Tanner Pearson, who injured his hand during a game against Montreal, had a surgery to correct things the next day. However, the forward recently was given the news that his season was over completely due to his need for a second surgery on the same hand. Defenseman Quinn Hughes recently revealed his frustrations with the team's medical staff during an interview. I feel bad for him. I mean, it wasn't handled properly, and you know, it's not really a good situation he's got there, and I'm hoping he's going to be alright," you said. And it was around November of 2022 as well that President of Hockey Operations Jim Rutherford also decided he was going to give the media plenty of sound bites. Rutherford began to blame Boudreau for the team's lackluster performance. I didn't like our training camp, and we continued into the early part of the season the same way as our training camp was, he said. You saw the games and the practices, not enough extra drive and tempo to prepare for a five-game road trip, and have a structure to make it easier for the players to play in all situations. According to an article from The Province that I'll link below, Rutherford also told the media that he thought Boudreaux was only supposed to coach through last season. He also he said the looseness with which Boudreaux's Canucks played last year was unsustainable and said, again, given the team's personnel, the team needed to play with more structure. So now looking forward, it's hard not to ask the obvious question here. Is coaching really the issue to all of the Canucks' woes? As Vancouver preps to bring in Rick Tockett, is the coach swap really going to make that much of a difference? Tockett, who had immense success with Phil Kessel in Pittsburgh, is known for being able to vibe with more headstrong type of players. It's entirely possible that Tockett's connection with Rutherford from their Steel City days may be what allowed the hiring to transpire. In conclusion, it really seems like former GM Jim Benning didn't have the patience to allow for his team to rebuild. Instead of waiting for the Ericsson contract to expire and just allowing the young talent to grow, he immediately tried to read Soul on the fly. Unlike GM Steve Eiserman in Detroit, who's been playing his cards the right way, Benning was the catalyst here. But GM Patrick Albin and company decided to extend Miller, knowing that the decision would likely be sealing Bo Horvat's fate. Horvat, who's 
probably going to be traded this season, is a lot better suited than Miller for captaincy between the two in my opinion. Regardless, you have to feel for Pedro, who was the innocent victim that was dragged into this mess. The coach was just trying his best with what he had to work with, but was only chastised out in the open for his efforts. Anyways, it'll be interesting to see how things play out after the coaching change and if this will change the team's performance in the long run.